Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. Today we resume our journey through H.G. Wells' The Outline of History. The portion that we're covering today, sections 7 through 9 of chapter 38, constitute Wells' entire account of World War I, which for him was the culminating event of all of human history, and also marks the end of the outline of history as written by H.G. Wells. Any subsequent sections, so the parts on the interwar years in World War II, were written by Raymond Postgate, one of Wells' friends and his official successor. So, in many ways, we are officially ending the series, although I'll probably revisit some of the other sections of Wells' history in due time. At any rate, sections 7 through 9 represent some of Wells' finest writing, and also some of his most intense opinions. In section 7, he gives a strong, unambivalent embrace of the notion that ideas are causative, that all historical events are ultimately driven, directly and indirectly, by the force of the ideas that are prevalent in a society and in the minds of its leaders. Such a view, what one would call intellectualism in the purest sense, was long out of fashion but effectively, I would say it's back in vogue now because of the heavy emphasis that a lot of people have had over the last decade or so on the importance of discourse. So if anything, what Wells says in this regard sounds like it could be out of any contemporary account where somebody's trying to explain why an act of violence occurred. It's an interesting dynamic. Had I been doing this video, say, five or six years ago, I would have just simply said that this is no longer a very fashionable view, even if it is one that has some merit and definitely had a hold for a long time. Wells, we have to remember, wrote in 1920, and there are some instances of his account of World War I which make it clear that he didn't know all of the particulars of what the government had done in terms of diplomacy and in dealing with some of Britain's more recalcitrant allies and neutrals. So there are a few details here which are mysteriously missing, and a lot of those because these details had not yet been released to the public. However, given that Wells was merely a civilian, albeit an educated and well-connected one, his account is pretty damn thorough in most ways when it comes to really getting the course of events right and coming up with plausible explanations for why people were doing what they were doing. One thing that becomes clear from the outset before he gets into the shells falling and the bullets flying through the air, one thing that's abundantly clear about Wells' attitude towards the war is that he thinks that Europe has no real chance of ever recovering to the state of prosperity and peace that it enjoyed prior to the outbreak of the war. If he were to learn that Europe enjoyed a higher standard of living decades later, he would probably be pretty shocked. In section 8, he describes the war's general course up to 1917. Here, he displays a very negative attitude towards professional armies and officers. Not only does he see these instruments as being effectively things which guarantee war, I think he said that in the past, but he also just thinks that the kinds of men who gravitate towards professional military careers are necessarily men of an inferior intellectual makeup. He effectively just says this outright. And this was actually a pretty common view throughout a great deal of the 20th century, especially in educated circles. Intellectuals often do look down their noses at military officers, and even among historians, there's a definite tendency, even today, for military historians to be seen as at the bottom of the totem pole intellectually when compared with, say, social historians or whatever you might have. Many of the generals of this period, however, interestingly enough, were actually relatively accomplished intellectuals. And that's still true in World War II. During a video I did with Sean, a tier ranking of World War II, we talked about some of the intellectual achievements of men such as Archibald Wavell, who was on the cusp of becoming a Cambridge English professor, 
before the outbreak of World War II effectively kept him in service. A lot of the men of that generation were in the military not because it was really what they wanted to be doing, but rather because they felt that there was a lot of social pressure for them to live up to their station in life and their family's reputation and by serving in the military. So quite a few people who were serving in the armies of Germany, Britain, France, etc., had they been born in a later age, might have chosen a different profession. And quite a few of these guys were actually accomplished intellectually, even if that did not necessarily translate into their military careers on a one-for-one -one basis. Again, I point to Archibald Wavell from World War II. Another example is Ian Hamilton, who was the British commander at Gallipoli. Clearly a very intelligent man, but someone who really did not have a very strong interest in his military career. The guy was already retired, and while he could write one hell of a diary, he had no idea about how to break the stalemate, and clearly just didn't have a lot of skill. So why was Wells so dismissive of the intellectual capacity of the men who commanded in World War I? There are a lot of reasons. Wells is frustrated mostly that a whole lot of these generals, many of whom were older gentlemen, were not gearheads. Wells was a science fiction writer, and for him, the possibilities and implications of new technology were something that he thought about every single day. For him, this was the thing people needed to be focused on. This was the future of warfare and everything else. So when he would encounter people who were stuck in a military tradition, who didn't see, for example, the obvious potential of something like the tank, he found it intolerable to have to deal with such a person, and he thought of that person as a complete and total dunce. Another factor is simply that once the war broke out, the causes turned out to be pretty dumb. The leaders of each country failed to make peace, even though they could have made peace on favorable terms on several occasions, especially the Germans. And of course, for all of these supposed accomplishments of these professional generals, as Wells observed, the butcher's bill was high, and many of them were unable to figure out how to break the stalemate of the trenches without turning to non-military men to develop things that would turn the tide. Wells also offers a controversial opinion that all of the truly great generals of history were either men whose societies did not enable them to choose some other career, men who were successful because they started when they were still young and very open to new ideas, or else they were absolute amateurs. I've never seen anyone else express this opinion, and while if I had just heard it in isolation, I might have laughed at it, when I think about it from Wells' perspective, in the light of what he had just experienced looking at World War I, I get exactly what he's saying and where he's coming from, and it actually makes a great deal of sense. And finally, what I think is perhaps the most interesting and valuable in the long term part of this entire section, Wells provides first-hand accounts of what it is like to be a Londoner during a German air raid, and also the sense of relief that everyone felt on Armistice Day in 1918, where people just kind of started driving around and wandering about. And it wasn't quite an outright display of exuberance, it was more just pure relief. And he really explains that so well, that I feel if you really want to put yourself in the mindset of someone living over a hundred years ago, who's just lived through four years of war, and now realizes that it's over, and that all of the new routines that they've learned will also be over. It just puts you right in that mind frame uh, perfectly. And especially that part about the German air raid where he describes what the uh, siren sounded like and the sequence of events and all of that, it really does illustrate something that is often overlooked today. Today, when people talk about the British home front, they only really talk about World War II and what it was like to be in an air raid during World War II. Wells' account shows that it was also pretty scary to be a Londoner during World War I, something that I think the History Channel overlooks pretty frequently. So anyway, those are just my thoughts on this reading. Uh, obviously, I found it pretty stimulating, and I enjoyed it. I hope you will, too.
I don't know when we will resume this series, but I plan to take a bit of a break from Wells and then come back later and perhaps look at some of his coverage of the ancient world or something along those lines. So, just enjoy this, and we will hopefully uh, see you around soon. Chapter 38 The Catastrophe of Modern Imperialism Section 7 The Immediate Causes of the Great War We have already been at some pains to examine the state of mind of Europe and of America in regard to international relations in the years that led up to the world tragedy of 1914, because, as more and more people are coming to recognize, that great war, or some such war, was a necessary consequence of the mentality of the period. All the things that men and nations do are the outcome of instinctive motives reacting upon the ideas which talk and books and newspapers and schoolmasters and so forth have put in the people's heads. Physical necessities, pestilences, changes of climate, and the like, outer things, may deflect and distort the growth of human history, but its living root is thought. All human history is fundamentally a history of ideas. Between the man of today and the Cro-Magnard, the physical and mental differences are very slight. Their essential difference lies in the extent and content of the mental background which we have acquired in the five or six hundred generations that intervene. We are too close to the events of the Great War to pretend that this outline can record the verdict of history thereupon. But we may hazard the guess that, when the passions of the conflict had faded, it will be Germany that will be the most blamed for bringing it about, and she will be blamed not because she was morally and intellectually very different from her neighbors, but because she had the common disease of imperialism in its most complete and energetic form. No self-respecting historian, however superficial and popular his aims may be, can countenance the legend, produced by the stresses of the war, that the German is a sort of human being more cruel and abominable than any other variety of men. All the great states of Europe before 1914 were in a condition of aggressive nationalism and drifting towards war. The government of Germany did but lead the general movement. She fell into the pit first, and she floundered deepest. She became the dreadful example at which all her fellow sinners could cry out. For long, Germany and Austria had been seeking an extension of German influence eastward through Asia Minor to the east. The German idea was crystallized in the phrase Berlin to Baghdad. Antagonized to the German dreams were those of Russia, which was scheming for an extension of the Slav ascendancy to Constantinople and through Serbia to the Adriatic. These lines of ambition lay across one another and were mutually incompatible. The feverish state of affairs in the Balkans was largely the outcome of the intrigues and propagandas sustained by the German and Slav schemes. Turkey turned for support to Germany, Serbia, to Russia. Romania and Italy, both Latin in tradition, both nominally allies of Germany, pursued remoter and deeper schemes in common. Ferdinand, the Tsar of Bulgaria, was following still darker ends, and the mysteries of the Greek court whose king was the German Kaiser's brother-in-law, are beyond our present powers of inquiry. But the tangle did not end with Germany on the one hand and Russia on the other. The greed of Germany in 1871 had made France her inveterate enemy. The French people, aware of their inability to recover their lost provinces by their own strength, had conceived exaggerated ideas of the power and helpfulness of Russia. The French people had subscribed enormously to Russian loans. French was the, uh, France was the ally of Russia. If the German powers made war upon Russia, France would certainly attack them. Now, the short eastern French frontier was very strongly defended. There was little prospect of Germany repeating the successes of 1870-71 to 71 against that barrier. But the Belgian frontier of France was longer and less strongly defended. An attack and overwhelming force on France through Belgium might repeat 1870 on a larger scale. The French left might be swung back southeastwardly on Verdun as a pivot and crowded back upon its right as one shuts an open razor. This scheme the German strategist had worked out with great care and elaboration. 
Its execution involved an outrage upon the law of nations, because Prussia had undertaken to guarantee the neutrality of Belgium and had no quarrel with her, and it involved the risk of bringing in Great Britain, which power was also pledged to protect Belgium, against Germany. Yet the Germans believed that their fleet had grown strong enough to make Great Britain hesitate to interfere, and with a view to possibilities they had constructed a great system of strategic railways to the Belgian frontier, and made every preparation for the execution of this scheme. So they might hope to strike down France at one blow and deal at their leisure with Russia. In 1914, all things seemed to be moving together in favor of the two central powers. Russia, it is true, had been recovering since 1906, but only very slowly. France was distracted by financial scandals. The astounding murder of the editor of the Figaro by the wife of the Minister of Finance brought these to a climax in March. Britain, all Germany was assured, was on the verge of a civil war in Ireland. Repeated efforts were made both by foreign and English people to get some definite statement of what Britain would do if Germany and Austria assailed France and Russia. But the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, maintained a front of heavy ambiguity up to the very day of the British entry into the war. As a consequence, there was a feeling on the continent that Britain would either not fight or delay fighting, and this may have encouraged Germany to go on threatening France. Events were precipitated on June 28th by the assassination of the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, an heir to the Austrian Empire, when on a state visit to Sarajevo, the capital of Bosnia. Here was a timely excuse to set the armies marching. It is now or never, said the German Emperor. Serbia was accused of instigating the murder, and, notwithstanding the fact that Austrian commissioners reported that there was no evidence to implicate the Serbian government, the Austro-Hungarian government contrived to press this grievance towards war. On July 23rd, Austria discharged an ultimatum at Serbia, and in spite of a practical submission on the part of Serbia and of efforts of Sir Edward Grey, the British Foreign Secretary, to call a conference of the powers, declared war against Serbia on July 28th. Russia mobilized her army on July 30th and on August 1st, Germany declared war upon her. German troops crossed in the French territory the next day, and the big flanking movement through Luxembourg and Belgium began. Westward rode the scouts and advance guards. Westward rushed a multitude of automobiles packed with soldiers. Enormous columns of gray-clad infantry followed. Round-eyed, fair young Germans, they were for the most part law-abiding, educated youngsters, who had never yet seen a shot fired in anger. This was war, they were told. They were to be bold and ruthless. Some of them did their best to carry out these militarist instructions at the expense of the ill-fated Belgians. A disproportionate fuss had been made over the detailed atrocities in Belgium, disproportionate, that is, in relation to the fundamental atrocity of August 1914, which was the invasion of Belgium. Given that, the casual shootings and lootings, the wanton destruction of property, the plundering of inns and of food and drink shops by hungry and weary men, and the consequent rapes and incendiarism follow naturally enough. Only very simple people believe that an army in the field can maintain as high a level of honesty, decency, and justice as a settled community at home. And the tradition of the Thirty Years' War still influenced the Prussian army. It has been customary in the countries allied against Germany to treat this vileness and bloodshed of the Belgian months as though nothing of the sort had ever happened before, and as if it were due to some distinctively evil strain in the German character. They were nicknamed Huns, but nothing could be less like the systematic destructions of these nomads who once proposed to exterminate the entire Chinese population in order to restore China to pasture then the German crimes in Belgium. Much of that crime was the drunkenly brutality of men who were, for the first time in their lives, were free to use lethal weapons. Much of it was the hysterical violence of men shocked at their own proceedings and in deadly fear of the revenge of the people 
whose country they had outraged. And much of it was done under duress because of the theory that men should be terrible in warfare and that populations are best subdued by fear. The German common people were bundled from an orderly obedience into this war in such a manner that atrocities were bound to ensue. Any people who had been worked up for war and led into war as the Germans were would have behaved in a similar manner. On the night of August 4th, while most of Europe, still under the tranquil inertias of half a century of peace, still in the habitual enjoyment of such a widely diffused plenty, cheapness, and freedom as no man living will ever see again, was thinking about its summer holidays. The little Belgian village of Vies was ablaze, and stupefied rustics were being let out and shot because it was alleged someone had fired on the invaders. The officers who ordered these acts, the men who obeyed, must surely have felt scared at the strangeness of the things they did. Most of them had never yet seen a violent death, and they had set light not to a village, but a world. It was the beginning of the end of an age of comfort, confidence, and gentle and seemly behavior in Europe. As soon as it was clear that Belgium was to be invaded, Great Britain ceased to hesitate, and, at eleven at night on August 4th, declared war upon Germany. The following day, a German mine-laying vessel was caught off the Thames' mouth by the cruiser Amphion and sunk, the first time that the British and Germans had ever met in conflict under their own national flags upon land or water. All Europe still remembers the strange atmosphere of those eventful sunny August days, the end of the armed peace. For nearly half a century, the Western world had been tranquil and had seemed safe. Only a few middle-aged and aging people in France had had any practical experience of warfare. The newspapers spoke of a world catastrophe, but that conveyed very little meaning to those for whom the world had always seemed secure, who were indeed almost incapable of thinking it as otherwise than secure. In Britain particularly, for some weeks the peacetime routine continued in a slightly dazed fashion. It was like a man still walking about the world unaware that he has contracted a fatal disease which will alter every routine and habit in his life. People went on with their summer holidays. Shops reassured their customers with the announcement, business as usual. There was much talk and excitement when the newspapers came, but it was the talk and excitement of spectators who have no vivid sense of participation in the catastrophe that was presently to involve them all. Section 8. A Summary of the Great War Up to 1917 we will now review very briefly the main phases of the world struggle which had thus commenced. Planned by Germany, it began with a swift attack designed to knock out France, while Russia was still getting her forces together in the east. For a time, all went well. Military science is never up to date under modern conditions, because military men are, as a class, unimaginative. There are always, at any date, undeveloped inventions capable of disturbing current tactical and strategic practice, which the military intelligence had declined. The German plan had been made for some years. It was a stale plan. It could probably have been foiled at the outset by a proper use of entrenchments and barbed wire and machine guns, but the French were by no means as advanced in their military science as the Germans, and they trusted to methods of open warfare that were at least 14 years behind the times. They had a proper equipment neither of barbed wire nor machine guns, and there was a ridiculous tradition that the Frenchmen did not fight well behind earthworks. The Belgian frontier was defended by the fortress of Liege, 10 or 12 years out of date, with forts whose armaments had been furnished and fitted in many cases by German contractors, and the French northeastern frontier was very badly equipped. Naturally, the German armament firm Krupp had provided nutcrackers for these nuts in the form of exceptionally heavy guns firing high explosive shell. These defenses proved, therefore, to be mere traps for their garrisons. The French attacked and failed in the southern Ardennes. The German host swung round the French left with an effort of being irresistible. The last fort at Liege fell on August 16th. Brussels was reached on August 20th, 
and the small British army of about 70,000, which had arrived in Belgium, was struck at Mons in overwhelming fashion, and driven backward in spite of the very deadly rifle tactics that it had learnt during the South African War. The little British army was pushed southward, and the German right swept down so as to leave Paris in the west and crumple the entire French army back upon itself. So confident was the German high command at this stage of having won the war, that by the end of August German troops were already being withdrawn for the Eastern Front, where the Russians were playing havoc in East and West Prussia. And then came the Allied counterattack. The French produced an unexpected army on their left, and the small British army, shaken but reinforced, was still fit to play a worthy part in the counterstroke. The German right overran itself, lost its cohesion, and was driven back from the Marne to the Ain, Battle of the Marne, September 6th to 10th. It would have been driven back farther had it not had the art of entrenchment and reserve. Upon the Ain it stood and dug itself in. The heavy guns, the high explosive shells, the tanks needed by the Allies to smash up these entrenchments did not yet exist. The Battle of the Marne shattered the original German plan. For a time, France was saved, but the German was not defeated. He had still a great offensive superiority in military skill and equipment. His fear of the Russian in the east had been relieved by a tremendous victory at Tannenberg. His next phase was a headlong, less elaborately planned campaign to outflank the left of the Allied armies and to seize the channel ports and cut off supplies coming from Britain to France. Both armies extended to the west in a sort of race to the coast. Then the Germans, with a great superiority of guns and equipment, struck at the British round and about Ypres. They came very near to a breakthrough, but the British held them. The war on the Western Front settled down to trench warfare. Neither side had the science and equipment needed to solve the problem of breaking through modern entrenchments and entanglements and both sides were now compelled to resort to scientific men, inventors, and such like unmilitary persons for counsel and help in their difficulty. At the same time, the essential problem of trench warfare had already been solved. There existed in England, for instance, the model of a tank which would have given the Allies a swift and easy victory before 1916. But the professional military mind is by necessity an inferior and unimaginative mind. No man of high intellectual quality would willingly imprison his gifts in such a calling. Nearly all supremely great soldiers have been either inexperienced, fresh-minded men like Alexander, Napoleon, and Hoche, politicians turned soldiers like Julius Caesar, nomads like the Hun and Mongol captains, or amateurs like Cromwell and Washington. Whereas this war, after 50 years of militarism, was a hopelessly professional war. From first to last, it was impossible to get it out of the hands of the regular generals, and neither the German nor Allied headquarters was disposed to regard with toleration an invention that would destroy their traditional methods. The Germans, however, did make some innovations. In February the 28th, they produced a rather futile novelty, the flame projector, the user of which was in constant danger of being burnt alive. And in April, in the opening of a second great offensive upon the British, Second Battle of Ypres, April 22nd to May 24th, they employed a cloud of poison gas. This horrible device was used against Algerian and Canadian troops. It shook them by the physical torture it inflicted and by the anguish of those who died, but it failed to break through them. For some weeks, chemists were of more importance than soldiers on the Allied front, and within six weeks the defensive troops were already in possession of protective methods and devices. For a year and a half, until July 1916, the Western Front remained in a state of indecisive tension. There were heavy attacks on either side that ended in bloody repulses. The French made costly thrust at Arras and in Champagne in 1915, the British at Luz. From Switzerland to the North Sea, there ran two continuous lines of entrenchment, sometimes at a distance of a mile or more, sometimes at a distance of a few feet, at Arras, e.g., 
And in and behind those lines of trenches, millions of men toiled, raided their enemies, and prepared for sanguinary and foredoomed offensives. In any preceding age, these stagnant masses of men would have engendered a pestilence inevitably. But here again, modern science had altered the conditions of warfare. Certain novel diseases appeared. Trench foot, for instance, caused by prolonged standing in cold water, new forms of dysentery and the like, but none developed to an extent to disable either combatant force. Behind this front, the whole life of the belligerent nations was being turned more and more to the task of maintaining supplies of food, munitions, and above all, men to supply the places of those who day by day were killed or mangled. The Germans had had the luck to possess a considerable number of big siege guns intended for the frontier uh, fortresses. These were now available for trench smashing with high explosives, a use no one had foreseen for them. The Allies throughout the first years were markedly inferior in their supply of big guns and ammunition, and their losses were steadily greater than the German. There was a tremendous German onslaught upon the French throughout the first half of 1916, round and about Verdun. The Germans suffered enormous losses and were held, after pushing in the French lines for several miles. The French losses were as great or greater. They shall not pass, said and sang the French infantry, and kept their word. The Eastern German Front was more extended and less systematically entrenched than the Western. For a time, the Russian armies continued to press westward in spite of the Tannenberg disaster. They conquered nearly the whole of Galicia from the Austrians, took Limburg on September 2, 1914, and the great fortress of Przemysla on March 22, 1915. But after the Germans had failed to break the Western Front of the Allies, and after an ineffective Allied offensive made without proper material, they returned to Russia, and a series of heavy blows with a novel use of massed artillery were struck first in the south and then at the north of the Russian front. On June 3rd, Przemysla was retaken, and the whole Russian line was driven back until Vilna, September 18th, was in German hands. In May 1915, the 23rd, Italy joined the Allies and declared war upon Austria. Not until a year later did she declare war on Germany. She pushed over her eastern boundary towards Gorizia, which fell in the summer of 1916, but her intervention was of little use at that time to either Russia or the two western powers. She merely established another line of trench warfare among the high mountains of her picturesque northeastern frontier. While the main fronts of the chief combatants were in this state of exhaustive deadlock, both sides were attempting to strike round behind the front of their adversaries. The Germans made a series of Zeppelin, and later of Aeroplane, raids upon Paris and the east of England. Ostensibly, these were aimed at depots, munition works, and the like, targets of military importance, but practically, they bombed promiscuously at inhabited places. At first, these raiders dropped not very effective bombs, but later the size and quality of these missiles increased. Considerable numbers of people were killed and injured, and very much damage was done. The English people were roused to a pitch of extreme indignation by these outrages. Although the Germans had possessed Zeppelins for some years, no one in authority in Great Britain had thought out the proper methods of dealing with them, and it was not until late in 1916 that an adequate supply of anti-aircraft guns was brought into play and that these raiders were systematically attacked by airplanes. Then came a series of Zeppelin disasters, and after the spring of 1917, their use for any purpose but sea scouting declined, and their place as raiders taken by large airplanes, the Gothas. The visits of these latter machines to London and the east of England became systematic after the summer of 1917. All through the winter of 1917-18, London on every moonlight, moonlit night became familiar with the banging of warning maroons, the shrill whistles of the police alarm, the hasty clearance of the streets, the distant rumbling of scores and hundreds of anti-aircraft guns growing steadily to a wild uproar of thuds and crashes the swish of flying shrapnel, and at last, 
if any of the raiders got through the barrage with the dull, heavy bang of the bursting bombs. Then presently, amidst the diminuendo of the gunfire, there would come the inimitable rushing sound of the fire brigade engines and the hurry of the ambulances. War was brought home to every Londoner by these experiences. While the Germans were thus assailing the nerve of their enemy home population through the air, they were also attacking the overseas trade of the British by every means in their power. At the outset of the war, they had various trade destroyers scattered over the world, and a squadron of powerful modern cruisers in the Pacific, namely the Scharnhorst, the Neisenau, the Leipzig, the Nuremberg, and the Dresden. Some of the detached cruisers, and particularly the Emden, did a considerable amount of commerce destroying before they were hunted down, and the main squadron caught an inferior British force off the, off the coast of Chile and sank the Good Hope and the Monmouth on November 1, 1914. A month later, these German ships were themselves pounced upon by a British force, and all except the Dresden sunk by Admiral Sturdy in the Battle of the Falkland Islands. After this conflict, the Allies remained in undisputed possession of the surface of the sea, a supremacy which the Great Naval Battle of Jutland, May 31, 1916, did nothing to shake. The Germans concentrated their attention more and more upon submarine warfare. From the beginning of the war, they had had considerable submarine successes. On one day, September 22, 1914, they sank three powerful cruisers, the Abu Kir, the Hogue, and the Cressy, with 1,473 men. They continued to levy a toll upon British shipping throughout the war. At first they hailed and examined passenger and mercantile shipping, but this practice they discontinued for fear of traps, and in the spring of 1915 they began to sink ships without notice. In May 1915 they sank the great passenger liner the Lusitania without any warning drowning a number of American civilians. This embittered American feeling against them, but the possibility of injuring and perhaps reducing Britain by a submarine blockade was so great that they persisted in a more and more intensified submarine campaign, regardless of the danger of dragging the United States into the circle of their enemies. Meanwhile, Turkish forces, very ill-equipped, were making threatening gestures at Egypt across the desert of Sinai. And while the Germans were thus striking at Britain, their least accessible and most formidable antagonist, through the air and under the sea, the French and British were also embarking upon a disastrous flank attack in the east upon the Central Powers through Turkey. The Gallipoli campaign was finely imagined, but disgracefully executed. Had it succeeded, the Allies would have captured Constantinople in 1915. But the Turks were given two months' notice of the project by a premature bombardment of the Dardanelles in February. The scheme was also probably betrayed through the Greek court, and when at last British and French forces were landed upon the Gallipoli Peninsula in April, they found the Turks well entrenched and better equipped for trench warfare than themselves. The Allies trusted for heavy artillery to the great guns of the ships which were comparatively useless for battering down entrenchments, and among every other sort of thing that they had failed to foresee, they had not foreseen hostile submarines. Several great battleships were lost. They went down in the same clear waters over which the ships of Xerxes had once sailed to their fate at Salamis. The story of the Gallipoli campaign from the side of the Allies is at once heroic and pitiful, a story of courage and incompetence, and of life, material, and prestige wasted, culminating in a withdrawal in January 1916. Linked up closely with the vacillation of Greece throughout this time was the entry of Bulgaria into the war, October 12, 1915. The king of Bulgaria had hesitated for more than a year to make any decision between the two sides. Now the manifest failure of the British at Gallipoli, coupled with a strong Austro-German attack in Serbia, swung him over to the Central Powers. While the Serbs were hotly engaged with the Austro-German invaders upon the Danube, he attacked Serbia in the rear, and in a few weeks the country had been completely overrun. The Serbian army made a terrible retreat through the mountains of Albania to the coast, 
where its remnants were rescued by an Allied fleet. An Allied force landed at Salonika in Greece and pushed inland toward Monastir, but was unable to render any effectual assistance to the Serbians. It was the Salonika plan which sealed the fate of the Gallipoli expedition. To the east in Mesopotamia, the British, using Indian troops chiefly, made a still remoter flank attack upon the Central Powers. An army, very ill provided for the campaign, was landed at Basra in November of 1914 and pushed up towards Baghdad in the following year. It gained a victory at Ctesiphon, the ancient Arsacid and Sassanid capital, within 25 miles of Baghdad, but the Turks were heavily reinforced. There was a retreat to Kut, and there the British army, under General Townsend, was surrounded and starved into surrender on April 29, 1916. All these campaigns in the air, under the seas in Russia, Turkey, and Asia, were subsidiary to the main front, the front of decision between Switzerland and the sea, and there the main millions lay entrenched, slowly learning the necessary methods of modern scientific warfare. There was a rapid progress in the use of the airplane. At the outset of the war, this had been chiefly used for scouting, and by the Germans for the dropping of marks for the artillery. Such a thing as aerial fighting was unheard of. In 1916, the airplanes carried machine guns and fought in the air. Their bombing work was increasingly important. They had developed a wonderful art of aerial photography. And all the aerial side of artillery work, both with airplanes and observation balloons, had been enormously developed. But the military mind was still resisting the use of the tank, the obvious weapon for decision in trench warfare. Many intelligent people outside military circles understood this quite clearly. The use of the tank against trenches was an altogether obvious expedient. Leonardo da Vinci invented an early tank. Soon after the South African War, in 1903, there were stories in magazines describing imaginary battles in which tanks figured, and a complete working model of a tank made by Mr. J. A. Corey of Leeds was shown to the British military authorities, who of course rejected it in 1911. Tanks had been invented and reinvented before the war began. But had the matter rested entirely in the hands of the military, there would never have been any use of tanks. It was Mr. Winston Churchill, who was at the British Admiralty in 1915-16, who insisted upon the manufacture of the first tanks, and it was in the teeth of the grimmest opposition that they were sent to France. To the British Navy, and not to the Army, military science owes the use of these devices. The German military authorities were equally set against them. In July 1916, Sir Douglas Haig, the British commander-in-chief, began a great offensive which failed to break through the German line. In some places he advanced a few miles, in others he was completely defeated. There was a huge slaughter of the new British armies. And he did not use tanks. In September, when the season was growing too late for a sustained offensive, tanks first appeared in warfare. A few more put into action by the British generals in a not very intelligent fashion. Their effect upon the German was profound. They produced something like a panic, and there can be little doubt that had they been used in July in sufficient numbers and handled by a general of imagination and energy, they would have ended the war there and then. At the time, the Allies were in greater strength than the Germans upon the Western Front. The odds were roughly 7 to 4. Russia, though fast approaching exhaustion, was still fighting. Italy was pressing the Austrians hard, and Romania was just entering the war on the side of the Allies. But the waste of men in this disastrous July offensive brought the Allied cause to the very brink of disaster. Directly, the British failure of July had reassured the Germans. They turned on the Romanians, and the winter of 1916 saw the same fate overtake Romania that had fallen upon Serbia in 1915. The year that had begun with the retreat from Gallipoli and the surrender of Kut ended with the crushing of Romania and the volleys fired at a landing party of French and British Marines by a royalist crowd in the port of Athens. It looked as though King Constantine of Greece meant to lead his people in the footsteps of King Ferdinand of Bulgaria, but the coastline of Greece is one much exposed to naval action. Greece was blockaded, 
and a French force from Salonica joined hands with an Italian force from Bologna to cut the King of Greece off from his Central European friends. In June 1917, Constantine was forced to abdicate by the Allies, and his son Alexander was made king in his place. On the whole, things looked much less dangerous for the Hohenzollern imperialism at the end of 1916 than they had done after the failure of the first great rush at the Marne. The Allies had wasted two years of opportunity. Belgium, Serbia, and Romania, and large areas of France and Russia were occupied by Austro-German troops. Counterstroke after counterstroke had failed, and Russia was now tottering towards a collapse. Had Germany been ruled with any wisdom, she might have made a reasonable peace at this time. But the touch of success had intoxicated her imperialists. They wanted not safety, but triumph. Not world welfare, but world empire. World power or downfall was their formula. It gave their antagonist no alternative but a fight to a conclusive end. Section 9. The Great War from the Russian Collapse to the Armistice Early in 1917, Russia collapsed. By this time, the enormous strain of the war was telling hardly upon all the European populations. There had been a great disorganization of transport everywhere, a discontinuance of the normal repairs and replacements of shipping, railways, and the like, a using up of materials of all sorts, a dwindling of food production, a withdrawal of greater and greater masses of men from industry, a cessation of educational work, and a steady diminution of the ordinary securities and an honesties of life. More and more of the European population was being transferred from surroundings and conditions to which it was accustomed to novel circumstances which distressed, stimulated, and demoralized it. But Russia suffered first and most from this universal pulling up of civilization from its roots. The Russian autocracy was dishonest and incompetent. The Tsar, like several of his ancestors, had now given way to a crazy pietism, and the court was dominated by a religious impostor, Rasputin, whose cult was one of unspeakable foulness, a reeking scandal in the face of the world. Beneath the rule of this dirty mysticism, indolence and scoundrelism mismanaged the war. The Russian common soldiers were sent into battle without guns to support them, without even rifle ammunition. They were wasted by their officers and generals in a delirium of militarist enthusiasm. For a time, they seemed to be suffering mutely as the beasts suffer. But there is a limit to the endurance even of the most ignorant. A profound disgust for the Tsardom was creeping through these armies of betrayed and wasted men. From the close of 1915 onwards, Russia was a source of deepening anxiety to her Western allies. Throughout 1916, she remained largely on the defensive, and there were rumors of a separate peace with Germany. She gave little help to Romania. On December 29, 1916, the monk Rasputin was murdered at a dinner party in Petrograd, and a belated attempt was made to put the Tsardom in order. By March, things were moving rapidly. Food riots in Petrograd had developed into a revolutionary insurrection. There was an attempted suppression of the Duma, the representative body, attempted arrest of liberal leaders, the formation of a provisional government under Prince Lvov, and an abdication March 15th by the Tsar. For a time, it seemed that a moderate and controlled revolution might be possible, perhaps under a new Tsar. Then it became evident that the destruction of confidence in Russia had gone too far for any such adjustments. The Russian people were sick to death of the old order of things in Europe, of czars and of wars and great powers. It wanted relief, and that speedily, from unendurable miseries. The Allies had no understanding of Russian realities. Their diplomatists were ignorant of Russian. Genteel persons, with their attention directed to the Russian court rather than Russia, they blundered steadily with the new situation. There was little goodwill among the diplomatists for republicanism, and a manifest disposition to embarrass the new government as much as possible. At the head of the Russian Republican government was an eloquent and picturesque leader, Kerensky, who found himself assailed by the deep forces of a profounder revolutionary movement, the Social Revolution at Home, 
and cold-shouldered by the Allied governments abroad. His allies would neither let him give the Russian people land nor peace beyond their frontiers. The French and British press pestered their exhausted ally for a fresh offensive. But when presently the Germans made a strong attack by sea and land upon Riga, the British Admiralty quailed before the prospect of a Baltic expedition and relief. The new Russian Republic had to fight unsupported. In spite of their great naval predominance and the bitter protest of the English Admiral Lord Fisher, 1841-1920, it is to be noted that the Allies, except for some submarine attacks, left the Germans the complete mastery of the Baltic throughout the war. The Russian masses were resolute to the end of the war. There had come into existence in Petrograd a body representing the workers and common soldiers, the Soviet, and this body clamored for an international conference of socialists at Stockholm. Food riots were occurring in Berlin at this time, war weariness in Austria, and Germany was profound. And there can be little doubt in the light of subsequent events that such a conference would have precipitated a reasonable peace on democratic lines in 1917 and a German revolution. Kerensky implored his Western allies to allow this conference to take place, but fearful of a worldwide outbreak of socialism and republicanism, they refused, in spite of the favorable response of a small majority of the British Labor Party. Without either moral or physical help from the Allies, the moderate Russian Republic still fought on and made a last desperate offensive effort in July. It failed after some preliminary successes and another great slaughtering of Russians. The limit of Russian endurance was reached. Mutinies now broke out in the Russian armies, and particularly upon the Northern Front, and on November 7, 1917, Kerensky's government was overthrown, and power was seized by the Soviet government, dominated by the Bolshevik socialist under Lenin, and pledged to make peace regardless of the Western powers. Russia passed definitely out of the war. In the spring of 1917, there had been a costly and ineffective French attack upon the Champagne Front, which had failed to break through and sustained enormous losses. Here, then, by the end of 1917, was a phase of events altogether favorable to Germany, had her government been fighting for security and well-being rather than for pride and victory. But to the very end, to the final pitch of exhaustion, the people of the Central Powers were held to the effort to achieve a complete victory. To that end, it was necessary that Britain should be not merely resisted, but subjugated. And in order to do that, Germany had already dragged America into the circle of her enemies. Throughout 1916, the submarine campaign had been growing in intensity, but hitherto it had respected neutral shipping. In January 1917, a completer blockade of Great Britain and France was proclaimed, and all neutral powers were warned to withdraw their shipping from the British seas. An indiscriminate sinking of the world shipping began, which compelled the United States to enter the war in April 6, 1917. Throughout 1917, while Russia was breaking up and becoming impotent, the American people were changing swiftly and steadily into a great military nation and the unrestricted submarine campaign, for which the German imperialist had accepted the risk of this fresh antagonist, was far less successful than had been hoped. The British Navy proved itself much more inventive and resourceful than the British Army. There was a rapid development of anti-submarine devices underwater, upon the surface and in the air, and after a month or so of a serious destruction, the tail of the submarine sinkings declined. The British found it necessary to put themselves upon food rations, but the regulations were well framed and ably administered. The public showed an excellent spirit and intelligence, and the danger of famine and social disorder was kept at arm's length. Yet the German imperial government continued to fight. If the submarine was not doing all that had been expected, and if the armies of America gathered like a thundercloud, yet Russia was definitely down, and in October the same sort of autumn offensive that had overthrown Serbia in 1915 and Romania in 1916, was now turned with crushing effect against Italy. The Italian front collapsed after the Battle of Caporetto, and the Austro-German forces poured into Venetia and came almost within gunfire of Venice. Germany felt justified, therefore, in taking a high line with the Russian peace proposals, and the peace of Brest-Litovsk 
March 2, 1918, gave the Western Allies some intimation of what a German victory would mean to them. It was a crushing and ex exorbitant peace, dictated with the utmost arrogance of confident victors. All through the winter, German troops had been shifting from the eastern to the western front, and now in the spring of 1918, the jaded enthusiasm of hungry, weary, and bleeding Germany was lashed up for one final supreme effort that was really and truly to end the war. For some months, American troops had been in France, but the bulk of the American army was still across the Atlantic. It was high time for the final conclusive blow upon the Western Front, if such a blow was ever to be delivered. The first attack was upon the British in the Somme region. The not very brilliant cavalry commanders who were still in command of a front upon which cavalry was a useless encumbrance, were caught napping. And on March 21st, in Goff's disaster, the 5th British Army was driven back in disorder, almost to Amiens. The jealousies of the British and French generals had prevented any unified command of the Allied armies in France, and there was no general reserve whatever behind Goff. Nearly a thousand guns were lost by the Allies, and scores of thousands of prisoners. Throughout April and May, the Germans rained offensives on the Allied front. They came near to a breakthrough in the north, and they made a great drive back to the Marne, which they reached again on May 30th, 1918. This was the climax of the German effort. Behind it was nothing but an exhausted homeland. Marshal Foch was put in supreme command of all the Allied armies. Fresh troops were hurrying from Britain across the Channel, and America was now pouring men into France by the hundred thousand. In June, the weary Austrians made a last effort in Italy and collapsed before an Italian counterattack. Early in June, Foch began to develop a counterattack. By July, the tide was turning, and the Germans were reeling back. The Battle of Chateau Thierry, July 18th, proved the quality of the new American armies. In August, the British opened up a great and successful thrust, and the bulge of the German lines toward Amiens wilted and collapsed. August 8th, said Ludendorff, was a black day in the history of the German army. The British attack on the Hindenburg Line in September ensured the Allied victory. Germany had finished. The fighting spirit passed out of her army, and October was a story of defeat and retreat along the entire Western Front. Early in November, British troops were in Valsiennes and Americans in Sedan. In Italy also, the Austrian armies were in a state of disorderly retreat, but everywhere now the Hohenzollern and Habsburg forces were collapsing. The smash at the end was amazingly swift. Frenchmen and Englishmen could not believe their newspapers as day after day they announced the capture of more hundreds of guns and more thousands of prisoners. In September, a great Allied offensive against Bulgaria had produced a revolution in that country and peace proposals. Turkey had followed with a capitulation at the end of October, and Austria-Hungary on November 3rd. There was an attempt to bring out the German fleet for the last fight, but the sailors mutinied November 7th. The Kaiser and the Crown Prince bolted hastily and without a scrap of dignity into Holland. On November 11th, an armistice was signed and the war was at an end. For four years and a quarter, the war had lasted, and gradually it had drawn nearly everyone, in the Western world at least, into its vortex. Upwards of eight millions of people had been actually killed through the fighting. Another 20 or 25 millions had died through the hardships and disorder entailed. Scores of millions were suffering and enfeebled by undernourishment and misery. A vast proportion of the living were now engaged in war work, and drilling and armament, and making munitions, and hospitals, and working as substitutes for men who had gone into the armies, and the like. Businessmen who had been adapting themselves to the more hectic methods necessary for profit in a world in a state of crisis. The war had become, indeed, an atmosphere, a habit of life, a new social order. Then suddenly it ended. In London, the armistice was proclaimed about 11 a.m. on November 11th. It produced a strange cessation of every ordinary routine. Clerks poured out of their offices and would not return. 
Assistants deserted their shops. Omnibus drivers and the drivers of military lorries set out upon journeys of their own devising, with picked up loads of astounded and cheering passengers going nowhere in particular, and careless whither they went. Vast vacant crowds presently choked the streets, and every house and shop that possessed such adornments hung out flags. When night came, many of the main streets, which had been kept in darkness for many months because of the air raids, were brightly lit. It was very strange to see thronging multitudes assembled in an artificial light again. Everyone felt aimless, with a kind of strained and aching relief. It was over at last. There would be no more killing in France, no more air raids, and things would get better. People wanted to laugh and weep and could do neither. Youths of spirit and young soldiers on leave formed thin, noisy processions that shoved their way through the general drift and did their best to make a jollification. A captured German gun was hauled from the mall, where a vast army of such trophies had been set out, into Trafalgar Square, and its carriage burnt. Squibs and crackers were thrown about. But there was little concerted rejoicing. Nearly everyone had lost too much and suffered too much to rejoice with any fervor. 